Okay. So we are going to put the shortcuts in here. So the long way, I have to teach you. That's what I did the notes on, right? Was the long way? Yes. The long way has benefits and that intuitively I think it makes the most sense that when you find the derivative of an inverse, you find the inverse first. How do we find the inverse? Swap x and y. Okay. And that from there you would just find the derivative, right? That makes sense to most of us. Okay. So when um, we sit down and you guys are going to start harassing me because I do need to get you guys your uh, cheat sheet requirements. When we sit down and do our cheat sheet requirements, you are going to put examples of the long way on your cheat sheet. Okay. And you're going to put examples of the long way um, when it says something like this, like evaluated at two, but you're actually not plugging two in. Right. You actually ended up plugging in the square root of three. Does that make sense? Because when it says evaluate it for two, the X's and the Y's start to get swapped back and forth. That's how inverses work. So that when it said F of two, we're actually plugging in root three. Okay. So that we need to pay attention to that when we actually sit down and do our cheat sheets. So when you do your cheat sheet requirements for inverses, if any of it does not make perfect sense, ask me. Because on this particular cheat sheet, the inverses is the part that students usually get marked down for. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it as like clear as possible. But if it doesn't make sense, let me know. Because this part of the cheat sheet, like I said, I'm going to keep putting on problem sets and stuff. This part of the cheat sheet, you're going to come back to over and over and over again to make sense of it. So we're going to make sure we have long examples of like, this is how you do it longhand, no shortcut. This is how it actually works. And then we're going to show like our shortcuts of like, how can you shorten these steps? Okay. All right, so here is the shortcut. Shortcut. Let's say you have a function. You have like f of x equals something. Then we're going to go ahead and say that your inverse equals some other function. Okay, we're just going to call it g of x. So f of x just equals something. I don't even know what it equals. But our inverse equals another function. That's what we're going to say. Okay? Then the derivative of that other function. So this is the derivative of the inverse. That's what this notation is. The inverse is f inverse of x. That's g of x. And now I'm saying the derivative of g of x. So this is the derivative of the inverse, okay? The derivative of the, of the inverse is 1 over f prime of g of x. f prime of g of x, okay? So this right here is called composition. It's when you have one function plugged into another function. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take this shortcut, we're going to walk back through our notes, through those previous examples, and we're going to use the shortcut on them. Okay, so we can see, okay, the long way worked, but so does the shortcut. Okay, all right, example one. So here we had f of x. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the... Um, we're going to use this formula right here. So we're going to find the derivative of f of x, and then we're going to take the inverse, and we're going to put it inside. Okay? So the derivative of f of x is what? 4x. Okay? And in part a... We did the inverse, right? We did the inverse right here. And so this is our g of x. I'm going to go ahead and write that down. g of x is right here. That's the square root of x plus 4 over 2. We found that in part a. Are we comfortable so far? Okay. So that means that g prime of x equals... 1 over, and it's 
f prime evaluated at g of x. How do I take f prime and evaluate it at g of x? You plug in g of x to the x value. So we're going to be writing 4. And then instead of writing 4 times x, I'm going to say 4 times and then the g of x gets written right here, x plus 4 over 2. Okay, so step A, that first part where we found the inverse function, this is math 3, math 2, math 1, wherever you first learned that, right? That's, that is not calculus, okay? That's, we've done that before. So this, you can find this, that's your g of x. Then we go up here and we find our derivative. That derivative was very simple. Do you agree? Okay. Now compare this to your final answer. Is it the same? It's the same. Did we do as much work? So conceptually, it does, I don't think it makes much as much intuitive sense, okay, because we skipped so many steps, right? It's a formula. So this is the reason I don't only teach it this way, because if you brain fart and you are taking the test, then you can sit there and you can go the derivative of an inverse. I tried x and y, that's an inverse, and then I find the derivative. That is a process you can do. It is drawn out, but it is something you can remember. This, however, real nice shortcut. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, we got that one. Let's go. All right, so find the inverse. Um, we've got, sorry, let me look at the correct part of my notes. Okay, so this is the problem. So we're going to say f inverse of x, or sorry, f prime of x. We're going to find the derivative because we need that. f prime of x is what? x squared plus 1. Okay. And then keeping in mind, I'm going to put this up here. Keeping in mind, this is our formula. And g of x is just the inverse. Then we're going to say g of x is what? What was the inverse? The invert, this is the tricky part. Here's the inverse. I wrote it right here. See the f inverse of x, right? The f inverse of x was this y. So g of x is just y. Because, so think about it this way. Um, inverses, you have to have y equal something, right? Whenever we found inverses in math 3, we traded the x and y, and then what did we do? We solved for y. It is impossible to solve for y here. We don't know how to do that. But we know that if you could get the y alone, the inverse would be y equals the equation. So y represents the inverse. y is a single variable that represents the inverse, even if I don't know what y equals. I don't know what it is, but I know that it represents the inverse. Okay, so I'm going to repeat that again. In math 3, to find the inverse, we traded the x and y. And then we got y alone. And we said y equals the inverse. Okay, I'm going to write that off to the side. y equals the inverse. That's what we always did in math 3. We traded the x and y, and then we got y alone, and we said y equals the inverse. So even if I can't solve for y, y is still the letter that represents the entire inverse. Okay, so if I read this, I say x equals one-fourth times the inverse cubed plus the inverse minus one. Does that make sense? So the inverse is just not solved for. It's just in the middle of the problem. It's not solved for. If you can solve for it, you should. Okay, but we can't solve for it. All right, does that make more sense? Okay, so trade x and y, we solve for y if we can, but y by itself represents the entire whether or not I have solved for it.
okay? So g of x just equals y. Okay, now let's do the shortcut. So the shortcut, g prime of x, say that one more time. Oh, I just, just went to sleep. It said, you're boring, nap time. Okay, so now we're going to say 1 over, and what are we going to do? Yeah, 3 fourths, plug in something for x plus 1. The something that we plug in for x is the g of x, which is y. And if you compare that to your answer, that's what your answer was. Miss Rice, I freaking hate you! Why you do that to me? Okay. Now, the parts that I did in green, did we understand those? So if this is an x-coordinate and this is a y-coordinate for the original function, then since inverses always trade x and y in the equations, they trade x and y for the points as well. So if 2 was an x-coordinate for the original function and 3 was a y-coordinate for the original function, then for the inverse, 3 is the x-coordinate, 2 is the y-coordinate. This is so simple, and it is used all the time in multiple choice problems. All the stink in time. Okay? Yes. For, so depending on the problem, you may or may not have to use a calculator. They may just say f of 2 equals 3 in the problem, and then you go, sweet, I can switch them. Or they may say f inverse of 3 equals 2 in the problem, and you say, sweet, I can switch them. Like, they'll give you information in the problem so that you don't need a calculator to get a value. Okay, so it's possible in a multiple choice problem that it's calculator active and then we have to do some math to find it ourselves. But it's also possible in a calculator inactive problem that they don't give that they give you the number and you go sweet, just flip them. I got my inverse. Yes. I'm telling you, you can do that because if we talk about tangent lines. We need an x and a y coordinate for a tangent line, so that's something they could throw at us, okay? Um, they're going to start talking about a slope. we got a slope of the regular function versus a slope of an inverse. So think about slope. It is rise over run. Rise over run is y's over x's. So if I switch the y's over x's, right? So if I have the y's over x's for my original function, what's going to happen for my inverse function? It's going to be x over y. They're just going to flip, right? The numbers are going to flip. So if my original function had a slope of 1 over 5, my inverse function would have a slope of 5 over 1. Does that make sense? So those are some of the really simple ideas that kind of get out of your head. You just don't think about it. And then you go, oh, yeah, x and y trade. Oh, that, I guess that makes sense. But we, I have to teach you the complicated way because that's where it comes from. I, I would be a bad teacher if I didn't teach you where it comes from. But we got these shortcuts and we have these little tricks where if you also look at the basics of X and Y trade, you can kind of understand that too. I think this is a lesson where we trip through it today. We are clumsy through it today. And then we do it over and over and over on problem sets. And maybe the fifth problem set you do it on, it, it's, it starts to click and you start to get them right every time. I think there is a process of learning it. And I'm trying to figure out how to teach it better so students don't struggle with it as much. And so I'm trying to make sure that I do my best teaching it today, that I do a good job of helping you get it on your cheat sheet. And I make sure that you're prepared to continue to do it, not just today, but do it over and over and over again in the future. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. All right, let's continue. We got one more example that we're going to work on this with. Last one. All right. So tell me how I should look at this one. Derivative of f of x. Okay, so f prime of x. 2 minus sine x. Okay. G of x is... What is g of x? It's y. Yeah, we didn't solve for y again, so g of x is just y. Yeah, we couldn't solve for it. 
two Ys in the problem, couldn't isolate them, had to just leave them there. Yeah, so, yeah, so we, that was us taking the derivative of it. But when we actually took the inverse, we traded the X and Y, and we were unable to solve for Y, so we just went, okay, I guess I'm done with the inverse. Cool. So my inverse is just Y. I'm going to write that off to the side again. Y equals the inverse. If we were able to isolate it, we would know exactly what the inverse is. We were not able to isolate it, so our function, so our equation is written in terms of an inverse. It is x equals 2 times the inverse plus cos of the inverse, whatever that means. Funky, but it is how it works this time. Okay, and so now when we take the derivative of this inverse, the derivative of the inverse is 1 over 2 minus sine y. Okay. So if we make sense of this a little bit, this is the slope, right? Okay, so this, I'm going to take another color. This is rise over run, right? That's rise over run, so that's y's over x's, right? So these are y's over x's. And when we've gone from here to here, we inverted it, right? See how we inverted it? We got run over rise. Do you guys see that? And then the thing that used to be an x is now a y. You guys see that? So the inverse is happening. Okay? easier to see in the ones where you can't solve for y. Let's look at it in the, the previous example. So flip the page to the previous one. Flip to this one. Okay. Yeah. It's the derivative. G prime of x is the derivative of the inverse of the inverse of f. Derivative of the inverse of f. So this, this is the slope of f. This is the slope of the inverse of f. Slope of f, slope of the inverse of f. Yes? So F, yeah, F inverse prime of X. Yeah, this is just, so what they did is they, is they said for this formula, F inverse prime of X is very confusing notation. So what they did is they said, okay, instead of saying F inverse, let's just call the inverse G. And then it's a little bit easier to differentiate between what you're doing. Okay, so the conceptual understanding here is that rise over run becomes run over rise. All our x's and y's are trading. Does that make sense? All of our x's and y's are trading. So rise over run becomes run over rise. Y over x becomes x over y. This was an x, now it's a y. Anything that was an x and a y is trading. If we look at the example that we did um, just before that, the same thing happened. We had this is kind of over a 1, right? So right here we had rise over run, we had y's over x's, and then when we get down here we have run over rise. The variable that used to be an x has become a y. Does that make sense? Okay. This one is a little bit less clear, but I'm going to talk through it anyway. Okay. This is rise over run. This is rise over run. Right? We got y's over x's, so we can see the run over rise. 
Now, it had an X, the X and the Y traded, and if we look, what used to be an X became a Y, this is a Y, and the Y represented square root X plus 4 over 2. We just were able to actually replace it, okay? So the X became a Y, we were just able to replace it. Does that make sense? Okay, that's where the formula is coming from. Do we see that? So rise over run becomes run over rise. X's and Y's trade. That's the whole idea behind the inverse is the X's and Y's trade. Okay. That actually might be an easier way to remember this shortcut. Okay. Any questions? I will repeat that as many times as I can today over the next several days. When you hit it on a problem set, please don't struggle with it. Ask me questions and I will continue to repeat those answers. Okay. On the problem set, the, the hardest part that students have is they go back to their notes and they try to do it the hard, the long, hard way on, their, on the problem set. And I think instead of learning the shortcut well, instead of it really making sense, they start to confuse themselves. So I would rather, it's probably the one type of question on a problem set that I will help you with every time. Does that make sense? Because with repetition, we actually, it, you'll have the epiphany moment, but you need the repetition to get there. The epiphany may not happen today. It may not happen this unit. It may happen a few units from now that you'll be like, okay, I'm finally comfortable with inverses. Okay. They are just funky enough that students tend to have a hard time with them. All right. It doesn't mean that they're, that they are out of reach though. It doesn't mean they're out of reach. It just means that they are, they are, uh, they are abstract enough that the grasping at them is a little bit hard. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and give out today's assignment.